coming out, everyone. Thank you for the Hawaii Cannabis Expo. Thank you to Drew for helping us set up this panel and giving us the opportunity to discuss with you all today. Um, this panel is highlighting the Hawaii Alliance for Cannabis Reform and some of our efforts uh, to work the legislative system um, to improve things at the state capitol. Um, so, first of all, I just want to give a little bit of a background on the HACR, uh, how it's formed, and um, what the importance of the group is. So uh, this is a member organization. Um, we have a few members currently that have signed on to the coalition. It's a, mostly some nonprofits. It's the Hawaii Innocence Project, Doctors for Drug Policy Reform, Last Prisoners Project, Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement, Drug Policy Form of Hawaii, ACLU of Hawaii, Marijuana Policy Project, Cannabis Education Hawaii, and the Chamber of Sustainable Commerce. Uh, we have some other organizations that, that hop in and help out when they can, uh, but these are the main organizations that are working uh, through the legislative system to get some changes done. Uh, HACR was formed roughly about two years ago. Um, a marijuana Policy Project came to the islands uh, in the form of Devon Ward, who was a policy uh, individual who has worked in uh, criminal justice reform, he has his own law firm, uh, and helping on this issue. He helped put this coalition together. Um, last year, there was a big effort um, to do legalization. The year before that, there was also an effort. Um, and then this, per, this first year, or the second year, has been kind of the bigger collaborative effort um, to get things done. So um, we have some panelists here today, and I'm going to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves um, and then to talk about their organizations, what their interest is in this issue, um, and how they collaborate with the uh, HACR. So we can start out at the end there with Wendy. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming out for this. Um, I'm Wendy Gibson Viviani. I'm a cannabis nurse educator, and I worked for the Drug Policy Forum and Medical Cannabis Coalition of Hawaii for seven years as an organizer. So um, I served on a, a handful of task forces um, that helped give recommendations to legislators um, about what should be in certain bills. And um, the most recent of those task forces was in 2022, which was the dual use of cannabis task force. And we were tasked with looking at the impacts of adult use legalization on the medical cannabis program and also on public health in general. And we came up with a, a bunch of recommendations about what should be in a legalization bill for the legislators. <clears throat> Sir, could you please stop interrupting? It's really, it, you know. Ah, okay. I know, but just wait till the end. You know, like the question let, let, people get, let people have a chance to speak. We really don't need editorializing. We really don't. You know, we're here. We're here to try to give you some information. No, and we got all that information. We need all our information. I, I, I don't have the information. Just wait till the end, if you don't mind. Can, can you okay. please just let other people have a chance to learn? Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Aloha, my name is Nico Sleverens. Uh, I'm with the Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii. Um, I serve as the board president uh, there. Um, I've been talking about uh, cannabis issues for about 20 years, dating back to my time with Drug Policy Forum in, in Sacramento and part of their Sacramento office. Um, so very briefly, um, I've seen sort of the cannabis landscape here. Uh, the medical cannabis landscape is, is very cramped. It's very, uh, it's, it's not functional the way it could be. Um, and a lot of that is due to bureaucratic resistance and political lethargy. Um, one of my concerns, and I, we have, as a coalition, we have many deep concerns with the, the Attorney General's bill, and we've outlined those on a, on a sheet here um, that look for the No More Drug Board banner, and we'll be talking about some of those concerns. Um, we also, you know, have listened to, you know, the hemp industry and some of their concerns about being you know, lassoed into the prospective cannabis control board. 
And again, industrial hemp is, is another case study along with uh, our medical cannabis dispensary system of government having authorization and having a regulatory structure in place and not properly implementing it. So, you know, I, I can see why the hemp industry does not want to be included in the cannabis of, uh, authority. Um, so we can talk about that later. I, I too served on the adult use uh, uh, cannabis board. I was one, when, I think Wendy and I were one of only, two, were the only two community members that were not aligned with government or not aligned with industry. Um, and it's really important to, I, I come from California, so I'm used to having a grassroots participation. And I, I do invite you know, grassroots participation and we need people uh, to get out there and, and raise their voices and provide testimony and provide their perspectives to legislators. Um, we're a diverse community. We need to prioritize and emphasize uh, small farmers. We need to prioritize and em emphasize a Native Hawaiian community that continues to bear the front of this state's criminal legal system in the cannabis space, in drug law enforcement, and elsewhere. So um, this, this, this bill provides us a vehicle to talk about that. It's very imperfect. Um, I was quoted in Marijuana Moment recently saying, this is, this is the velvet glove of, of legalization on the iron hand of law enforcement. So we need to tread very, very carefully when it comes to what's actually in this bill's content. So um, I've probably gone on too long, but uh, here is uh, Kim Coco from the Chamber of Sustainable Commerce. Thank you, Nikos. Um, thank you for the opportunity to join this conversation. Uh, the Chamber of Sustainable Commerce uh, made up of mostly small businesses. Uh, we believe or we pursue a triple bottom line, and that's people, planet, and prosperity. Um, we believe that we can strengthen our economy without hurting workers, uh, without hurting consumers or communities or the environment. Um, we are mostly focused, um, we advocate for mostly small businesses against corporate greed and the power of corporate lobbyists. Um, and specifically on this issue, um, I'm a particularly, um, or we are particularly concerned, um, or um, primary focus is to ensure that small farmers who are growing food for local consumption are the first ones to get um, commercial grow permits for non-medical cannabis. Um, if it does move in that direction, and we want to make sure that those, um, we want to make sure that the profit margins that um, can be made off growing, you know, whether it's cannabis, hemp, whatever it is, um, that that amazing profit margin will go and, um, you know, subsidize growing food, which a lot of our farmers are already doing. Uh, right, it helps them, it'll help them undercut those expenses so that we have more food being grown in Hawaii for local people. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, Again, these are just some of the individuals on our coalition that are working and engaging the lawmakers. Um, a lot of the groups here have had uh, other issues they work on at the legislative process. Uh, this happens to be one that we have some core ideas that we agree on when it comes to legalization. Um, so just to introduce a little bit more about HACR, the mission of HACR is dedicated to ending cannabis prohibition in Hawaii and replacing it with a system of legalization and regulation with a focus on reparative justice and inclusion, and really emphasizing that reparative justice and inclusion portion. Uh, we have a lot of great organizations that have worked on criminal justice reform in the past, uh, prison reform in the past. Uh, we have the Council of Native Hawaiian Advancement that is looking for opportunities to up uplift our local communities. Um, and given what we're gonna be talking about today is some of the difficulties in the, in the legalization bill that come up, we really wanna highlight our efforts to in encourage individuals to get involved and discuss those specific provisions in this bill. Make sure we are uplifting our local community, making sure that people who are most harmed by the war on drugs are at the front of the line when we talk about what's happening in cannabis reform. So next we are going to um, kind of give a little context and I'll provide a little bit of context to where we are today. So we've had a medical program for about um, roughly seven to eight years, and it has been very difficult to get this medical program uh, fully functional. And the state capitol has, has discussed um, legalization bills in the past, or the legalization of cannabis. Um, they've passed now, the Senate has passed it twice out of their entire chamber. 
um, and the house is yet to, to hear a bill. So here we are in 2024, and to pass a bill in, in the state of Hawaii, um, it's, it's different than other states. So right, so uh, Nikos has seen in California, places like Oregon and Washington, you can have a ballot initiative. You can go out and collect a bunch of signatures from individuals and get a, and get something passed in your state. Hawaii does not have that process. We have to go through the legislature. We have to go through our elected officials. And that presents a huge hurdle, especially when it comes to uh, a legislature that hasn't been favorable for cannabis in general. It was very difficult for us to get the medical program as it is. Um, and to make changes in that has been very, very difficult. So now we have um, the executive branch, the attorney general, who has looked over the issue and provided their comments. We have the Senate, which is another branch of government who has now passed something. And now we're looking at the House of Representatives to take a stand and uh, move forward on this issue. So if those three items come together, we can have a very robust conversation and a possibility of legalizing cannabis in Hawaii. And that's where we are today. Um, Full legalization has it's now had one formal legislative working group task force, which Nikos, myself, Wendy has sat on, um, and it's now followed up with two bills. And the current bill we're going to discuss today is House Bill 2600 and Senate Bill 3335. This is kind of a combination of a lot of that work um, that has been put together into a, a package um, introduced in both the House and the Senate, and is going to be the, the uh, vessel this year is gonna get the most conversation around legalization. So if those of you wanna provide comments and testify, please take note, uh, HB 3335 has been scheduled for a hearing. So there will be a hearing on this bill in the Senate, and it's going to be on the 13th of this month at 9 a.m. So if you wanna provide comments, either show up in person um, or, or submit them online, you can do so. So the next part I wanna, provide to the panelists to discuss a little bit about is diving a little bit deeper into this legislation, into the work that we have all been doing and the interactions we're doing on our, our uh, bi-weekly calls, interactions with um, policy leaders, and discuss some of our concerns about this bill. And then after the concerns, we'll discuss about some things that we think are positives in the bill and things we can strengthen. Um, so maybe I'll start with Nico, since you have a, a deep policy experience in California and uh, here in Hawaii. Maybe we can talk about some of the, the, the high the high level challenges in our legalization bill this year. Yeah, so so when so when this bill came across the transom and when we took a look at it, there there were a lot of deficiencies. Let's just be, be plain about that. Um, again, we're appreciative to see a, a, a lengthy vehicle, a comprehensive vehicle but it was far, far too law enforcement heavy. Um, we have a list, I, I think I've held this up before, of things that we can go down. Um, again, if we're going to legalize adult use cannabis, we must center small farmers on every county. We don't need Walmart weed or the cannabis coming into Hawaii and extracting you know, our resources again. So I, I, I had the privilege of co-authoring an op-ed with Council Member Keani Rollins Fernandez and Representative Janae Capella that ran in Civil Beat on December 21st. It's called the End, End Cannabis Prohibition to Help Hawaii's Underserved Communities, to help benefit on Hawaii's underserved communities. Um, and I, we had, it's a lengthy thing, it's, but we, we understood that what's at stake here is ending this current prohibition regime that includes a very limited, very anemic medical cannabis sector and creating a thriving cannabis economic sector on every island, in, including rural communities. So we concluded our, our joint op-ed together, said that any solution must include Hawaiian hands working Hawaiian lands. And that is a very important baseline that I, I hope all of us will take forward into this conversation. Um, we're, not, we're not here to make money for, for discrete groups like you know, some of the current dispensary owners. Hey, they've done, they've done their part in a, in a difficult landscape. Um, they've, they've been patient, they've, been, they've played by the rules. But, yeah, but they shouldn't necessarily, you know, 
Yeah, they should. Yeah, they shouldn't necessarily have you know an inside track on it in the WCC. We get it. We get it. Yeah. Did you save your comments for the end? So let's. Did you want me to go down the list, Randy? Sure. Things? Let's let's go down a few of the items. Um, and okay. This is also a two-way street, so if there's any items that you guys, uh, you know, raise your hand for a question you want us to really dive in deeper on, um, we're going to talk about some things around like driving, drug to driving, stuff like that. If you want some more context, uh, feel free to, to raise your hand um, and we can call on you for some deeper discussion. So first off, um, just even the revenue allocation, uh, very law enforcement heavy, um, with only 25% going to social equity or community reinvestment. Um, I personally believe, and this is not the, the view of the, the authority, that we need resources going to community programs, including youth programming. We need resources dedicated to, to housing, including permanent supporting housing for those who need it. Um, we need increased access to behavioral health treatment outside of the, the carceral system. We have a, a very, very serious mental health uh, crisis going on even in this state particularly in our underserved communities in our rural communities I just talked with a, a woman working on Molokai and every time a young man a person takes a life there it's 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 all it's almost a surprise to them because we we, we don't have the, the capacity as a culture to talk rationally about our mental health system um, and that and that's throughout whatever whatever social strata you're in. Um, so we need we need to dedicate resources to to urgent uh, human and social needs. We also need vigorous expungement policies to ensure that you know those who have been harmed by cannabis prohibition you know get their records clear. Um, we also need to ensure that people who use cannabis have protections under law. This bill still has a whole bunch of collateral consequences if you use cannabis. So, you know, you can lose custody for your children, you can potentially lose state benefits, lose a professional occupational license, you can still have your parole or probation supervision revoked for, for use of cannabis. It really criminalizes youth. And this is one of the more pernicious things of the Attorney General's bill. Um, when, when Colorado uh, legalized in 2012, we actually saw an increase in youth arrest rates. And the disproportionate number of those were African-American youth in, in Colorado. Here, what we're gonna see is the increased criminalization of Native Hawaiian and Pacifica youth. So that needs to be nipped in the bud. Mm -hmm. um, we also have to build equity into the structure of, of our emerging cannabis economy. Uh, we have to take a look at craft, the craft cannabis model like they have in Maine where we encourage small entrepreneurs and farmers you know, to participate in the market and to create a mechanism for their participation. We don't need the cartelization of the cannabis sector. We need broad participation. We need to de also develop a cannabis tourism industry. Cannabis tourism, you know, I know, you know a lot of us don't like tourism, but people do come here from all over the world, mainly from the US West and, and even from Canada now. And they have adult use legalized uh, markets there, and they come here, and we don't. Why? Why aren't we meeting that need? We have a, we have a county prosecutor here in Honolulu, Steve Ong, saying that this is going to hurt cannabis tourism. No. <laughs> and we and I showed that you know in the in recent years, Canada has itself standing alone, not even counting the plurality of people coming from the U.S. West, providing more residents spending more money than people from Japan. So raising the specter that this is, this is going to impede and impair cannabis is just totally disingenuous. It's, it's classic drug war fear mongering. And you know, this, this Wednesday, I encourage you to come out uh, to, to the Memorial Auditorium near City Hall because Prosecutor Alm and Mayor Blangiardi are having an, another public forum uh, opposing adult use legalization, and could, but not just opposing commercialization to quote unquote keep Hawaii Hawaii. He's actually inviting people from the continent with a group called uh, Safer Sam, Safer Alternatives for Marijuana, whatever the acronym is. Smart, Smart approaches to 
mar marijuana, sorry, safer alternatives is something else. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, either you're for continued criminalization of cannabis, and, and this prosecutor is also very intent on maintaining criminalization of behavioral health issues and poverty. Um, so this fits into a piece. We have a probation system that has the highest average term in the nation, 59 months. A lot of that is due to our sentencing law, but a lot of that is due to our prosecutorial practices. So we have a, a city prosecutor who is basically of the Reagan Bush drug war mold, and we can do better. Sorry, when is this? Uh, On Wednesday at the Memorial Auditorium next to Honolulu Hale, um, and uh, at 1 p.m. There so, are some flyers going around that, that discusses yeah. where that is, um, and then there is some organiz organiz organizing to uh, bring the opposing view to that space, um, hold some signs, hold some space to show that the community is in support of this issue, um, even though some of our elected officials are not. Okay, and before I conclude here for now, I just want to say that it's very important to take a look at what the Cannabis Authority uh, is composed of. Right now, it's a bunch of political employees, unpaid. Um, we need a professional body, regulatory body. We need, that means being paid. We need to have their deliberations be subject mostly to, to state sunshine laws to, pro to promote transparency, yes. We need representation from the, the Native Hawaiian community. And also, we have to ensure that nobody serves on this authority who has been a, a prohibitionist or aligned with prohibitionist organizations. Or I mean, Why well, I, I agree with that too. We don't. We don't need. You know. We don't. Again, we don't. We're not looking to promote Walmart weed. And this is what has happened. But that's what this implies. is what. This is what. Yeah. This is what has happened yeah. on the continent. Is that adult use legalization has served as an entree for large multi-billion-dollar corporations to come that in is, and take over. Thing, we get it. We get it. We get it. I get it. Yeah. I know. I know. You know, I would, yeah. So we need to make sure that this benefits the community, not mainland corporations. Wendy, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, the provision that we are concerned about around drugged driving in the bill, um, and maybe some of the, from your medical experience, some of the non-scientific medical um, foresights that are in that provision. Well, yes, there's a provision in the bill that would um, oh, I don't even know how to start. Um, <laughs> so, anybody caught um, driving with a blood level of, what is it, 0.5% or something? Five, five, five nanograms. Five nanograms, five nanograms per, milliliter. per milliliter will be considered to be driving under the influence and prosecuted fully. And we know that Science doesn't support any certain number, um, you know, as far as lab testing goes. Um, it, it doesn't show that the person was intoxicated, so they could be prosecuting many, many patients, including just medical cannabis patients, who w might well have those levels in their system, but are not driving intoxicated because it's just um, it's just not how cannabis works. Cannabis is a, a fat-based molecule uh, plant, and those, those fats um, get into your body fats and might persist for a, a lot longer than, um, you know, for well, quite some time. And so you might get tested and um, be prosecuted if, you, if your levels are a certain number, which is, uh, there's, there's no science behind the, the numbers that they've come up with, so that's something that we're going to oppose in, in the Attorney General's bill. And there's been some new data that's recently came out and some research around um, how arbitrary that number is, depending on what you've eaten that day, depending on, on your weight, your size, your, your metabolic uh, issues. You could you know, have consumed days before, you could be not impaired at all, but still have that five nanograms. Uh, and then now you're caught up in the legal, legal system whether you can prove your innocence or not, uh, that puts people in a really, really difficult position. And we shouldn't be making this harder. If we're gonna be legalizing in Hawaii, we should be making the lives of the local people and people who operate here much easier. 
Another part of this same provision that's in the bill that we want to highlight and push back on is the open container law. So as we all know, there's open container laws around alcohol. You can't have an open container of alcohol uh, in the car, things of that nature. But they are kind of mimicking that um, and wanting that to be the same for cannabis. So you can't have an open container of cannabis in the vehicle, whether you're a passenger or a driver, uh, and that can be criminalized. And we want to prevent that significantly. I mean, just because you have an open uh, uh, container of a flower does not mean that you are actively consuming when you're driving. doesn't mean you should be prosecuted for that. Uh, and that also includes passengers that maybe even are just holding on to a vaporizer. Um, so it's very broad and, it, and it's very harmful. So these are the, some items. And again, we have this laid out on our, our handout that we would love really public to come out and, and vocalize uh, how disappointed we are in some of these uh, overreaches of, of uh, criminalization of this, this issue. Any questions? It just, it seems we've had The, the other difficult part, as you mentioned, you know, the medical cannabis program has been around for a while, and there's no prohibition on your, your medical cannabis in your car at the moment. Uh, so this is actually going, going backwards and now setting up additional laws to uh, criminalize certain behavior. So um, patients are allowed to transport. Correct. But I don't think there's any open container. Mm -mm. And this would make it difficult. It also says you can't consume in your vehicle. Um, and some patients you know, utilize tinctures. Some patients utilize balms, salves, things of that nature. Um, before they go to uh, locations, before they're going to doctor's appointments, things like that, this would criminalize them not even be able to touch their medicine in their own vehicle. Again, something that is, is huge concern and, and, and overreach, in our opinion, of, of how to implement the system. Oh, it seems like it's all law enforcement all the time. So I, I guess I'm just wondering, is it actually common in states where it's been legalized for the police to arrest people and say, like, you've got an open container here? And the reason I ask is because I'm from Oregon, and we have the exact same laws. you got to have it in your trunk and all this stuff. And I've never heard of anybody actually getting arrested for having I never put it in the back, ever. And I just feel like maybe we're worrying about things that are, and again, this probably came as last words before, before we walk into the ovens, but, you know, I mean, are we really worrying about something that's going to happen? I mean, I'm no, afraid, I'm afraid it, that we're obsessed happening. with something that's not real. It's happening sure. now. Okay. Yeah, but our patients are being um, yeah, cited for driving under the influence if they test positive. Yeah. I mean, it's a good concern yeah, I, because... I thought that they didn't have a way to test that anybody accepted, so it was, it was on the books everywhere, but everyone's like, well, this just gets thrown out as soon as you're in court, because they're like, this is trash science, nobody accepts it. Sure. So, so we shouldn't have it in law. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. It's a, and it's a hassle for everybody who's involved. But I'm just kind of wondering, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't like it either. Right. But we can fix that later. Yeah. But you, you the, right, the history of racism in law enforcement, I mean, it, because it just becomes yeah. another excuse to. Yeah. to Selective to, enforcement. Yeah. And, and, and it's a good question because we, we do have current uh, a decriminalization of a very small amount of cannabis in Hawaii. Three grams or under, right? I mean, that's uh, nothing, right? It's less, less than an eighth. eighth. Most of us, if you're carrying your medicine, have more than that on you. Um, uh, the data has not been released by the law enforcement community yet on what the numbers are that are getting arrested for over that. We know that it's still pretty low, that the that, that Honolulu Police Department's not looking for people with a joint um, or a little bit over three grams. But there are consequences to having that in place, even as it is, if people aren't getting arrested for that specific item, right? Um, so although we don't have the arrest numbers of people getting arrested for cannabis possession in Hawaii, we do know that if you uh, have possession or in your system and you're in the parole system, you're, you're you know, trying to do better and you're, you're in that, that space, you pop positive for a test, now you're in prison. Now you're in jail. And, and again, the minute that an individual comes into contact with the criminal justice system is, it could be a, a down, downhill slope, right? So what we're really trying to do is pre prevent the, the interaction with criminal justice and the authorities in general, um, and this being one of them, uh, especially the open container law. Um, it does have a fine up to $2,000. Um, and, and again, it says when a cannabis package has ever been opened, loose cannabis or any pipe. So. Um, Auntie, do you have a question? Yeah, is it true that cannabis can actually 
stay in your system for months? The question is, is it true if the cannabis uh, can stay in your system for months? Yeah. Wendy, did you want to take yes, that? Yes, that is true, because it stays in your fat. Even though it's not actively working on you, it's still residual in, in your system. I think up to 90 days or so is probably the max. I have a question about the Attorney General. So they're hired by the governor. Does that mean the governor it's like they're basically speaking on behalf of the governor with all of these things that they put into the spill. I mean, should we be confronting the governor and holding him accountable for his AG's position? I, I think I think under under ordinary political circumstances, yes. You know, Josh Green campaigned for adult use cannabis legalization. And this represents a very significant shift on his part. Yes. Um, back when, when our dispensary bill was passed, he had to be taken off conference committee mm -hmm. because he was still opposed to, to even medical cannabis. But as more and more states legalize, as support, public support for cannabis legalization nationwide, and even here in Hawaii, we're over 55% for legalization, uh, I think he saw the opportunity and he saw that the, the handwriting's already on the wall and that we need to prepare Hawaii for, for legalization. Um, and under a situation where, you know, somebody is working for a governor, I would, I would hope that the governor at some point would take a more proactive public role in this conversation. That we, need, we need his input. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need him to, to come out and in support of public health and human rights and for the, yeah. the, the decriminalization yeah. of, of our communities, including the communities you know, that he represented when he was in the Senate. Um, and I think he gets that. Um, however, I also know that you know, he, it's general practice here for governors in this state to give their department heads broad latitude. Um, so just one example of where executive leadership really matters is is in Minnesota recently. Uh, you had a, a governor and a lieutenant governor uh, who was Native, uh, Native American. They were, they were leading the charge for adult use cannabis legalization, and they got that done. Another thing that Minnesota did last year was eliminate its drug paraphernalia law entirely. And we have a legislative vehicle, uh, you know, authored by uh, House Judiciary Chair uh, David Tarnas, that would get rid of our drug paraphernalia law entirely. Why is this important? It's Im important because paraphernalia remains the gateway into the criminal legal system for, for people who use drugs. Was um, it decriminalized? It, it was decriminalized, but it's still used as a pretext to search. Yep. So even if you have an unusable trace or residue of, of, of a controlled substance in that, especially if it, it represents a Class C felony. So, for example, if you have a grain of, of a, a white powder drug or, or something of that nature, or, again, uh, you know, whether it's fentanyl or heroin or, or something else, you are still going to be charged with a Class C felony that carries a, a fine of $10,000 and a five-year prison Can I term. expand on that? Yes, So, please, drug please. paraphernalia covers everything from rolling papers, pipes, and growing supplies and testing supplies. So it's, it's pretty broad in what they can get you for. <laughs> so it, I, I really think that Hawaii should join uh, Minnesota in eliminating its drug paraphernalia law. Um, the state of Alaska has never had a drug paraphernalia law, so um, let's make it happen here too. And some of the shortcomings of this bill uh, and, and how we're, we're been strategizing to address them and working with individuals is is putting up separate bills um, and kind of removing the conversation out uh, from under legalization as a whole package and saying, how can we accomplish these things uh, on its own? So uh, just to put on everyone's radar, there are some bills relating to expungement, expungement of your records if you do have a conviction of cannabis um, or in some cases, uh, convictions that should be expunged across the board, a clean slate bill. Um, so. The Judiciary uh, Committee in the House will be hearing three medical cannabis bills, or excuse me, two medical cannabis bills and um, a criminal history expungement bill. 
um, and that is going to be um, the JHA Committee on 131. Actually, that happened already, no? Yeah. It did, okay. We're in February now. We are in February, absolutely. Too quick. Um, but these are, um, one of them is to uh, require the Department of Health to adopt rules and circumstances in which medical cannabis may be transported between individuals, um, between islands, things of that nature. Um, and then the decriminalization or the, excuse me, expungement bill is up for um, hearing as well. So again, a strategy that we have, if we can't get it going from the attorney general standpoint um, on expungement, which they've been resistant to, we will introduce a separate measure. So it's not kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying we should kill all measures because it doesn't have everything we need. We will find uh, other, other ways and opportunities to support um, our initiative. So how does that work in terms of this large comprehensive legalization um, uh, bill that the Attorney General created that's all this bad stuff, but then we're all using it to try to say, you know, put good stuff in. Mm -hmm. So that's comprehensive. And then we have all of these a la carte bills mm -hmm. that are getting different pieces. So what happens if they all keep moving? Do they all consolidate into one thing? Committee. No, but I mean, no, realistically, mm -hmm. how does that... It's mm -hmm. um, a great question. Can I, can I offer... Please. Uh, preliminary opinion yeah. and I don't think anybody knows the answer to that until the legislature actually adjourns and we see what's what's standing. Um, but in terms of this adult use legalization bill, um, I think it's very widely assumed that the Senate, you know, is going to hear the bill. It will take some amendments. I hope it takes all of our amendments, but I'm not counting on that. Um, and the vehicle is going to pass the Senate, I think, fairly quickly because we already have you know, 80% uh, plus majority who, who voted for adult use legalization. So, you know, it's it's no no real new, new ground for them, uh, with the exception of, of three members who I won't name and give them publicity. Um, <laughs> but uh, really quickly, so it crosses over, right? Um, Tarnas may or may not hear it, depending upon what the what the wins are, you know, uh, but the, the other real hurdle here is the finance committee uh, chaired by, by Yamashita and uh, some of his members. And, you know, we have, just, just, just to note how different things are here in Hawaii, we have two out gay members of the legislature and they are not 110% in support of, of adult use cannabis legalization. And it, it's kind of exploding my mind actually. Um, that we have that uh, here, so, um, so. It's the connection, huh? I don't see the connection. Oh, we have we have one of orientation and Harvey Milk. Oh, okay. Don't you re don't you remember Harvey Milk yeah, having just... his? It was he was a cannabis reformer in the '70s, yeah. and it's right. and it's personal choice and autonomy, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that you know those those of us who are queer, you know, are choosing that that fashion, but it's absolutely how do we want to. Live yeah. our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And, and users are forced into the closet. Right. Exactly. <laughs> or even in the in, even in the context of medical care. Yeah. yeah. You know, when, when your doctor asks you if you use cannabis, it's mm -hmm. like what incentive is there for you to, to be honest? Yeah. And these are young men. Too. Right. These yeah. are young men. Yeah. Just well thank funny. you for asking that question because <laughs> you know, I just make the leap, right? Um, but yeah, um, if so we have roughly 20 minutes left. Um, I want to go over a few more things before we open up for Q&A. Quick Q &A. question from the back. Sure. What are the ramifications if we remove cannabis from Schedule 1? It's, sort of it's a great question. The, the, so, so the federal government right now um, is seriously considering moving it from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. Um, and it's a big discussion in the cannabis community right now. What's the best course of action? Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the coalition, but for myself, an individual who's, who's looked at this issue, I would like to see it descheduled completely. It shouldn't, it shouldn't exist on any CSA at all. Um, the difficulty of when it goes to Schedule 3 um, is that it can provide some opportunities in the cannabis space, but the big question is who is going to capitalize on that opportunity? And as it currently stands in the cannabis uh, community nationwide, it's those who have money and power and influence. Um, so we have to be careful about when they do reschedule, which they, they probably will, um, about 
setting up a program, and this is why it's so important that what we do here in Hawaii and what this coalition is doing, to make all of the uh, opportunities go towards individuals who live, operate, um, and have equal access across the board. Um, it will provide some banking opportunities, um, possibly. Um, banks may loosen up a little bit um, and allow uh, individuals to bank. Um, maybe some credit unions will be a little bit more um, open to it. Uh, but again, to be determined yet. Um, again, business expenses. Um, question from the back. Yes, I've been to uh, Iverson's Grove in Oregon. They're the largest producer and processor. And they were told by their banks, because of the current laws, hemp being included in any of all this, on the hemp grower, but hemp being included in any of all this, Iversons were assured that they would be having their insurance canceled and they would have no banking ability, and all their bank notes would be called in if they tried to grow hemp next year. Now, how is it we're going to protect our hemp growers here in Hawaii in the same fashion? Because if the hemp is included in this at all, that is like Tarnas is killing the farmers with what he's doing by his action if you support hemp being included in this. Like, he's being completely separate. Hemp is already legal. We don't need to associate it with something that's considered illegal. And then wipe out the small industries, which have all been but crushed here in Hawaii. So how are we going to deal with that? But the question is, why is hemp being included in the cannabis authority when the hemp industry, you know, faces so many roadblocks and obstacles, and has not really been allowed to be brought online in a, in a significant fashion here in Hawaii? And I just say, I, I've been talking to to hemp farmers a bit. I talked to Gail from from Hawaii Island, and to to some folks from Kauai and from Maui as well. And the point is well taken that we have, you know, federal authorization for hemp. We have a state law that authorizes hemp, but you know, the devil comes in the in the regulatory in the regulatory approach of our of our departments, right? And we they are not operating, you know, effectively or even in accord with the law. Um, we need a rule of statute, not and not empower bureaucrats to give their per, to inject their personal prejudices, um, and that that is why I think it's critically important that any cannabis authority be like a, a liquor authority, and that if you are a prohibitionist, or if you've been aligned with organizations that have been prohibitionists in the past, you have no business being anywhere near uh, the regulatory authority. Um, I think that, you know, because, because Gail knows, you know, uh, Representative Tardis quite well, they, she's been in her ear, uh, he, she's been in his ear, um, and the, the hemp community needs to, to, quite frankly, sound the alarm, because you are the canary in the regulatory coal mine where you can have everything together, right? You can even have a lot of licenses throughout the state, you know, dozens in, in every county, and yet because of regulatory overreach, you can't functionally operate in a manner that will sustain your livelihood or the livelihood of your employees. So the way we've approached hemp thus far in the state, the way we've even approached the medical cannabis industry such as this, these are very cautionary tales about how government, even with good laws in place, we need regulate, regulators who, who are honest, transparent, and not injecting their own agenda in, into, into the, to the economic sector. And, and to note, what's in the current bill essentially states that everything regarding to the plant, which includes hemp, would fall under this authority. So the things that we are unknown still yet are what the authority is going to do. And I think, you know, there's, there's two, two ways it could go. The, the authority could listen to the hemp industry and say, okay, nothing changes, you know, or at least currently, and we'll work on some provisions. The authority is the individual now that you have to go lobby and discuss changes with, or the authority could then wrap hemp under the same provisions that uh, cannabis, THC cannabis sold in the market would look like. Uh, so it currently, and I think this is one of the difficulties of this bill, especially when it comes to licensing, when it comes to um, how these uh, licenses will be distributed, there's no definitions, there's no specifics. It just says this authority shall do these items. So even if the bill does pass and it has, say, uh, hemp roped into the authority, there will still be opportunity for the hemp industry and individuals invested in that space to then lobby the regulators 
to either keep what's here now, make some significant changes, and hopefully prevent them from doing what you say, which is uh, roping it into the same regulatory framework. And double regulation is expensive and not necessary. Absolutely. It's already regulated by the federal government with permits. We're abiding all that. Why does the state have to come in and help on that and pretend we're a drug and then make my banking go away? Right. <laughs> and I think that's a great argument to make, you know, if, if this does play out that way, to bring to the state government. And the state government loves to hear how they can save money and have less responsibility in some spaces. So they would be great to hear that if we can just leave it alone, let the federal government do it, and they not have to spend resources, allow that to continue. And I think if the hemp uh, group was able to, you know, really present that case in a very strong fashion, there could be um, some significant, you know, efforts made to make sure that the regulatory authority leaves it as is. I, and let me just reiterate here: it's critically important in the long term, or in the short term, that cannabis get rescheduled, but it needs to be taken off the Controlled Substances Act entirely. It never belonged there in the first place. It was put there by fiat. It can be taken off by fiat. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services just submitted a whole host of documents to the Drug Enforcement Agency saying cannabis is safer than alcohol. Cannabis has a 10,000 year history with humanity. 10,000 years. And 90 years ago, we say, oh, well, this is dangerous. It's like, come on. And they even recognized the medical usefulness of it. Yeah. So we. For the first time. In, in, 2009, in, in 2019, uh, the Hawaii legislature passed HCR 89, uh, which called for the passage of what was then called the Safe Banking Act. And it also called for the removal of cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. So. I'm, I'm going to seek to ensure that another resolution is passed this year. It's non-binding, but it sends a message to Congress. Take cannabis out of the Controlled Substances Act. Right. There is a doctor here, Dr. Cliff Otto, who has been working on trying to get it out of the Schedule One drug category just in the state using um, an exemption process that was used um, by a Native American church for peyote, so. So for the last 10 minutes or so of our, of our discussion, I do want to leave us on a high note. I know we've been talking about a lot of difficulties and the pains and hardships, you know, and this panel, individuals on this panel, people in this room have been working really, really hard, in some instances, for decades on this issue. Um, the Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii, which uh, some of us on this panel have been a part of for a long time, has now just been absorbed to Triple HRC uh, who's going to continue that great work, which is uh, super exciting because they have been a, a huge powerhouse for drug harm or uh, drug reform and harm reduction in the state. But there are some things in this bill that I think that we should note that are some significant progress from our current system. So um, personal possession and cultivation outside of being a patient. So if, you, if you're a patient in Hawaii in the medical system, you will continue to have your rights to grow your plants at home. Your 10 plants, you can still continue to have that. But if you're not a patient, you decide not to go get your card, you can cultivate up to six mature plants at home. So it's a little bit less than if you're a medical card holder, but then it would exempt anyone from criminal prosecution um, for six plants or more if you're over the age of 21. Marijuana or cannabis is one of the hardest crops to grow in the state of Hawaii. Many people don't have the ability or talent to grow the That's why we still need people. Absolutely. Right. Correct. So that's one of our biggest challenges is trying to preserve the legacy growers yeah. and not let the multinational state operators come in. And this bill does continue to allow caregivers to grow for individuals. Um, and I think that's another big win that we can say that isn't going to be taken away if this thing does pass. You can, you can designate someone to grow for you. Um, it does have uh, different licensing options. Um, it, it's a, it's a deviates from what we currently have, which is a vertically integrated system. It's a horizontal system. So then it would open up licensing and cultivation and business opportunities for everyone in the state. And I think that's really important to note. Um, and when discussing how that works for, for the national space and in Hawaii, you know, we are now 11 years behind the, the continent in terms of, of business opportunities and, and making this uh, an industry. 
And the, the longer we wait, and this is just my opinion, the, the, the more competition we're going to have. As we see currently, um, we have a huge influx of, of cannabis from other states in our, in our, on our streets, and we aren't going to be able to keep up with what happens. Uh, interstate commerce is going to be coming very soon. California, Oregon, and Washington are entering a pact um, to do some interstate commerce. Sooner or later, that's going to happen in our state, and we need to make sure that individuals who want to be in this space have the, the legal infrastructure, going to have grow sites that aren't being raided, um, have individuals who are up to speed on the regulations so that as soon as that pin drops, they're able to export cannabis to different states, um, able to have a robust market. Um, some other things in the bill that are, um, I would say, big pluses, given our conversation in the past. There is a pretty uh, significant social equity piece attached to it as a core provision. It's one of the core tenets, and I think um, a lot of that work can can be given to uh, credit, be given to Nikos, um, the the task force on social equity. They actually accepted a lot of those uh, recommendations on the task force to make sure that proceeds, the tax revenue that the state does collect, go towards reinvestment into social equity applicants. So waiving fees. So if there's a say a, a five thousand dollar fee to get a license, they would waive the fee if you're considered a social equity applicant. They would also provide small business um, input and, and assistance to get your business up and running. They would also provide you grants to get things like equipment, things of that nature, which we've seen in other states is crucial because access to capital is, is one big, big area. Um, because you can't have a bank, you can't go get a loan, right? So you have to have access to capital to build your growth site. Um, so that's included in the bill. And, and my hope is that we can raise the alarm about these things as well so that if this thing does pass, we have individuals who are in Hawaii who have this experience ready to go and put their, their papers in hands down so that we don't get pushed out by, say, uh, interests that are coming in from other states that want these licenses as well, right? Does that bill have anything that says that a lot of these licenses are going to go through the Native Hawaii? The question was, like, there's a current, like, bills, yeah, right, the, correct. Certain people, how, how does a Hawaii know that they can get one? Correct. This is a great question. Can you repeat the question? So the question is answer? essentially, um, does the bill um, give preference to Native Hawaiians specifically? Um, and the, the issue around this is, and we have all um, outwardly expressed that there is a desire that should happen, but legally, um, in terms of legal jargon and, and how the attorneys interpret things, that can't happen um, on paper straight up. And it, it's the same thing as it's the same thing as uh, you know preventing individuals from outside that, that aren't residents from getting a license. Same thing when buying homes here, there's a, there's a legal barrier around that. So what we have done is suggested what other states have also done is looking at zip codes, areas that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. And this is areas that are heavily uh, residents of Native Hawaiian communities. I think, I think another really important provision that can help further uh, Native Hawaiian uh, interests is to have an organization, I think having the Council for the Native Hawaiian Advancement being one of the regulators and making mm -hmm. sure that Native Hawaiians are at the table at the highest level of, of decision making. And I, I think knowing, you know, some of the, the people who work there, that, that they do have the interests of our rural Native Hawaiian communities at heart. And that, that's the way you get equity to, to, to put it in the bones of the regulatory structure, both in terms of the commission, you know, you know, the the diversity of licensing. Um, eventually, we can hopefully get to a craft cannabis landscape where that includes direct consumer sales, the roadside. We, we can really think about how do we empower individual farmers and small businessmen to participate in their local economy. So for the short answer, does it have it specifically? No, but there are ways to achieve that through policy that don't state that would run into legal issues. Um, and rest assured, this, this coalition is very focused on putting those issues up front. Um, another great thing about this bill is in terms of licensing, it does limit how large square foot of grows can be. And the, the purpose behind this, again, it came from the, du the dual-use task force, is to make sure that we don't have the glass houses of the cannabis industry, which have over you know, 200,000 square feet of canopy space 
in a certain location that can dominate the market because they have the capital is keep it low. Make sure our canopy space is, is low so it attracts local small businesses instead of large corporate entities that want to come in and be the Monsanto of cannabis, right? Um, and it does have these provisions. Uh, currently, it allows no more than 10,000 square feet canopy for an indoor grow, 5,000 for an outdoor grow. Now, I think individuals should comment on that because, you know, personally, I feel like those numbers should be adjusted a little bit. We want to make sure individuals that have the opportunity to, to grow outdoors have enough space for that. Um, the attorney generals are not experts on how to grow cannabis. So we need to input uh, on what that looks like. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, it, it is focusing on small entities in Hawaii. So does current licensees that have more than like 5,000 square foot of to be determined. So currently in law, um, cannabis dispensaries can only have 7,500 plants. There's no uh, space. Up to 7,500 plants, uh, 5,000 is kind of the, the, the limit. You can ask for a little bit more if you want. But to be determined on how the regulatory authority will approach that, right? And I think that's a really good question to continue to raise and say, how are the, the Individuals who are currently licensed going to be grandfathered in? Are they going to be held to the same standard? Uh, and what, what, how they're going to work that out in the long run? Am, am I correct that the bill also suggests, like, as the size of the grow increases, that the person running that grow has to pay more tax or something on that? Okay. Negative. Okay. So on, on the topic of tax, um, the tax rate has been set at 15% um, at, the, at the max. Um, so it's going to be a 10% tax on top of the GET tax, which essentially gets us to 15%. Um, you know, in terms of nationally, that's pretty low. So it's, it's a good, relatively good thing for, for businesses. I mean, a tax on cannabis is tough pill to swallow for a business entity that's already in a really difficult. One of the hardest industries to make a dollar is in the cannabis space, um, given federal regulations and others. But that money will, you know, again, we're really pushing to make sure that 15% tax that is taken out are reinvested back into our communities, given back to those social equity applicants, made sure they have equal opportunity. I would love to see some incubator programs like uh, the Hood Bear in California, um, like Sacramento has implemented, where they have uh, taken tax money to, to set up um, grow facilities that people can come use. They don't have to buy their own grow facility. So Randy, is it 15, like GET for instance, mm -hmm. if you sell to a retailer, that's fifteen percent, and then the retailer sells to the consumer. That's fifteen percent. Great question. So is that great what, question? Is that what's happening? So the the great thing about what Hawaii has done is they have made it only at the point of sale. Okay. So it's at the very end of the supply chain. One of the difficulties that California has had that's at every kind of point of the way, right? You're paying your tax when you when you distribute to your distributor, when you get from your seller, when you get from your grower. We have kind of. Let them know that that is not something we want to replicate in Hawaii. Will we ever, I mean, the, the tax model and the, and the expenses of growing, will we get um, adult use cannabis recreational uh, to the point where it's more affordable than crystal meth? It's a <laughs> great know. question. It, when it comes to business... <laughs> in Oregon, they got really cheap weed in the shop. I'm just wondering how much is crystal meth? Yeah, I don't <laughs> you know. But, but you know what I mean? Sure. I mean, the other difficulty about running a business in the cannabis space is, uh, at least federally, Hawaii did a great thing to allow you to write your taxes off locally, but you can't write taxes off for business expenses federally. So we have some cannabis businesses in Hawaii who have actually operated at a loss for years but are still paying taxes to the federal government. So they're, they're, it's, it's a difficult environment that we have to make if, ends meet. If, if I could make reference to some of my recent retail experiences in adult use states, including Nevada and, and California and, and uh, Arizona for that matter. Arizona is an adult use legalized state. You can actually get you know, a, a packet of gummies with 100 megs total for under, well under the cost of a, of a six pack of premium you know, a lager or a beer. And wow. so, um, back, back when I first came across the cannabis infused chocolates from Kiva, this was in the mid, around 2014, 15, I think it was, they had 120 megs for $15 and it was good chocolate too. And, and I, and I was a registered uh, patient at the time. And I was like, there is nothing I'd rather do than do this. Yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> well, we are, we are at our in limit. In terms of a topic. We'll take right? one more. One more question. Is there a number of social equity licenses that they kind of roll out, and is it only vertical, or is it going to be uh, transport, lounge, location, and then kind of the business model of the separated? Good question. Um, so currently in the bill, there are no specific number limits. Um, again, one of the challenges of the bill is that it gives the, uh, the regulatory authority kind of the broad base uh, ability to create that. So there could be, if this bill passes, that if the regulatory gets together and says, oh, we're only going to do 10 licenses, they could say that. And I think that's where, if this bill passes, to get the community together to say there should be no caps, there should be um, you know, X, Y, or Z. Um, also, it gives the authority the ability to, to do new licenses. So the bill does have just your regular cultivation, your retail, things of that nature. But it allows the authority to, to put in, say, delivery licenses, consumption lounges, things of that, if they're, they're lobbied to do so. And I think there's a strength in that and there's a weakness in that. The strength is that we can come together as an organization or as a community, go to the authority and not have to go to the legislature to lobby for that, not have to convince our elected officials that are worried about their elections and campaign donations. We're talking to regulatory bodies that are hopefully um, responsive to this issue. Um, Right. Right. So none of that goes to anything that nobody really needs. Correct. So this should be a vehicle that can actually help supplement the things that are very much needed, right? Absolutely. Completely agreed. How are regulators chosen? Okay. Got it. We're about wrapping up. Regulators, at least currently, um, are going to be appointed positions. And by the governor. By the governor. By the Senate. Correct. Um, I will leave you with this, is that... Uh, this conversation is ongoing at the legislature. Shape this, this process with all of you involved. And we should come to the table, discuss what we don't like, but also highlight what we do like. Uh, we have the opportunity to, to make that happen this year. Um, there's, a, there's maybe a little bit more than a 50% chance it happens. If not this year, then next year is going to be a big year as well. So stay engaged. Come visit us um, and ask how you can get involved, and we'll continue to send out um, alerts. Look and for the No More Drug War banner. The, no uh, more I'll drug be there war banner. Until seven tonight. I hope the heckler comes. <laughs> Thank you all. Please come talk to us afterwards if you need. Thank you. Oh yeah, totally. Oh, no.